This is Matthew Raphael Johnson, and it is the 24th of February, 2021. Um, if I'm a little depressed today, it might have something to do with the fact that I just spent $1,500 in property taxes. So, you know, if I fade in and out of coherence, you'll understand. Um, so, um, other than that, um, I want to thank all of my supporters, both financial and personal in every other way, for their assistance. Not just from the, the financial point of view, of course, but also from uh, a psychological point of view. That people are willing to give of themselves that way is really extraordinary. Um, especially in this, in this day and age. So, um, it means a lot that you can help, uh, essentially keep me independent, as I've said many times before, to, um, allow me to lead the scholarly and academic life, um, in an ascetic environment, needing very little, but doing this independent of a university or a think tank or a government or a church or anything else. The psychological angle is something that I've wanted to speak about for a long time. And it's from two different points of view. The first point of view is what are our enemies like? How does their mind operate? And how do we understand them at that level? But the second is, is just as important. And that is how are we to function emotionally, psychologically? Living in this age, living in 2021, we're living under a regime that has made it vehemently clear, using very precise language, that they want to destroy us. And they will figure out some way to break us, get us in jail, to explode some frustration. And they have every resource imaginable, and we frankly have nothing. Those two things together um, are things, by the way, no one on our side has even brought up. The simple question uh, as to how we're emotionally to deal with this every day. How do you function in society knowing that the what we call the normies out there don't even speak the same language as we do? We're not even defining terms in the same way. Even basic communication now is something that's being challenged. We're not dealing with logical people. But that's exactly the topic. Over the last 10 years, I've become an involuntary expert on the psychology of narcissism. Uh, I lived with one for some time. Um, many of you are aware of the phenomenon. Now, the term narcissism is used on a daily basis. And as always with Americans, the term is abused, is, uh, definitions are invented. Essentially what it comes down to is if someone doesn't like someone, they call them a narcissist. Now, I don't have, I don't like psychology as a discipline very much. That used to be a part of philosophy. And then sometime in the 19th century, it, it split off and became part of the, the modernist world, taking sometimes very ancient arguments and understandings, restating them in a very simplistic way and giving them new, very pompous, academic sounding names. That's essentially what they do. It's pretty rare that you can think of a single problem that psychology has solved. The DSM, their encyclopedia, changes every time a new one comes out um, based on the political pressures of the day. We're familiar with the, you know, the definition of homosexuality and the transgender stuff. It's simply a matter of political pressure that changed these concepts and definitions, paraphilia and all the rest of it. 
So it's not a discipline I necessarily take very seriously, especially given the fact that the Orthodox Church Fathers, especially in the Greek-speaking world, mastered the discipline of what we would call today psychology. And it's hilarious to see these guys, you know, these pompous psychologists, talking like it's revelation about concepts of the human mind that someone like, you know, Maximus the Confessor had talked about in detail, you know, 1,500 years ago. And, of course, they're clueless as to that fact. The separation of modern modern intellectuals, especially Christians, from the Church Fathers is, is a schism that you know, there is no cure for. It. The perversion of Christianity, the perversion of the intellect, because they're separated from these men uh, intellectually in every other way, the, the disease of Protestantism, which has relegated these men to irrelevance, Men, you know, these, the you know, Protestants who honest to God believe that the Bible fell from heaven, created and, and, you know, uh, paginated and, uh, neatly separated into books, uh, without any input from human beings. Men. Now, of course, the church put the Bible together and the church fathers put the Bible together. A very specific group of them. Narcissism is one of the most important concepts we can deal with today. I want to start off with something that I've dealt with many times. Of course, I'm a Platonist in the sense that Justin Martyr was a Platonist, that Maximus the Confessor was a Platonist. And one of the key elements there is the connection between the parts of the soul on the one hand and the nature of the state on the other put it in very simple terms, Plato divided the soul between the rational, the, um, what I guess we could call the spirited, and the passionate parts. The rational is based on logos, discerning the, the reason, uh, whether it be of the forms or their dim manifestations on physical things the spirited, or really the drive, almost a, an intellectual eros, the drive for, for knowledge and, and glory, which can be positive, can be negative, and then the passionate, or our lower drives, associated with the brainstem, uh, the hunger, uh, procreation, greed, desire for dominance. And they are they correspond with the state. The rational part of the soul corresponds with the so-called philosopher kings, the spirited with the guardian class, vaguely a, a, um, a dedicated, uh, almost a praetorian guard, and the passionate with the what we would call the masses, or the laboring class. Now, those aren't, none of those are value judgments except the sense, in the sense that they deal with greater levels of universality. Plato was immensely valuable because the doctrine of the forms is the least intellectual background for logos. Plato's forms are collected in the second person of the Trinity, in Christ himself, and these were used, they're created things. Though Plato may not have agreed with that. The created things, the archetypes from which creation stems. Um, and of course the passions is, you know, what we suffer with, the, the nature of the fall. The human man has all three uh, at war with him. And of course the state has all three. Justice can only be understood through the rational part. That rational part is violently under attack by those who deny its very existence. Reason and logic are not the same thing. The passions are not bad things. 
they're only bad when the rational element fails to take control over it. The rational element and the spirited, or the kind of the drives in, in, the, in the best sense, the drives to be, to be, um, to be strong, to be virtuous. The engine of our, of our actions work together to control, to canalize the, uh, the passions. Education, the tight control over, over culture is how these things are, um, brought together in a, in a rational unity, whether it be in the state or the soul. What I'm saying is that that's a, that's a true understanding, and we can see that today, although in a very perverted way. I'm going to explain some of the basic traits of the narcissist. And again, I'm taking this from modern psychology, but it's certainly a lot older than that. Again, I'm not sure if psychology is aware of this, but it's much older than that. And when I do it, it's going to be very easy to see how the regime manifests these traits on a collective level. The point being is that what we're dealing with is narcissism writ large. And I'm telling you that unless you understand the nature of the narcissistic personality, you will never understand the regime or our enemies or how to deal with them. Number one, the narcissist has a very exaggerated sense of self-importance. They believe themselves superior in one way or another. Of course, you see that in the regime, by their belief that they are the true end of history, that liberalism needs to impose itself on the world with any kind of force necessary. And that's number two, this need for admiration, to have everyone bow the knee to them. And of course, we see that here. Unless you bow the knee to liberalism, you will be destroyed. They monopolize conversations. And if they're ignored or rejected, they feel angry and envious. Number three, the relationships are really based on exploitation. They're based entirely on surface attributes. They don't care about essences. They don't care about what human nature is. They don't care about true friendship and virtue. They care about how people can be used. And that as far as the regime is concerned, is that's what capitalism is based on. Uh, nominalism, um, the obsession with, with production and logic. Not reason, but logic. Number four, they have a marked sense of uh, a lack of empathy. They are pathologically incapable of understanding the damage that they do to others, the emotional needs, the emotional condition of others. And again, as far as that relation to the regime, it almost doesn't need to be explained. From the English Revolution to the French Revolution to the Bolshevik Revolution to the revolution that we've been dealing with in this country for 40 years, killings and imprisonment and humiliation and destruction is their day-to-day life. Today, they're not even hiding that anymore. What people like me have been saying for 30 years and others for a lot longer than that now is fully admitted as true, and they're not shy about it. Number five, they have an unstable identity. They have this sense of self that on the one hand is very rigid. They have these ideological um, uh, obsessions that have to be imposed at all costs, really based on the fact that they're exceptional, that they have reached the... the, um, the purpose of history, and, and, and that's why they have a right to impose it and lie, easily threatened. But on the other hand, you see how that's applied is very inconsistent. Um, some of you may have seen the worship of the policeman um, allegedly killed at the uh, so-called Capitol riot the outpouring of the most exaggerated, maudlin language. These are the exact same people that just a few months ago were talking about the physical destruction and liquidation of police in different cities. No one can do that without having a severe 
uh, a severely unbalanced and disturbed psyche. There's no explanation for it otherwise. And we've all come across people who will say those two things to you, completely contradictory things, and not understand that it's a contradiction. Number six, the relationships are entirely based on shoring up their own sense of self-image. Everything is superficial. They don't care in any true sense of the term. The, you know, the notion of the, of, of public policy is about smashing their enemies and building up their power base. Number seven, they have chronic feelings of emptiness. There is no ultimate purpose to what they do. Often it's destruction for destruction's sake. Now we could say that the New World Order is based on lowering transaction costs in destroying nations, in um, creating this mass of helpless individuals dominated by media, having no real source of, of identity, uh, no reliable information, uh, cut off from the spiritual world, etc., etc. But even if they were to get that, would they be happy then? Would the oligarchs who rule most of the planet today, if they got everything they wanted, would they be happy? Would they say, okay, we're done, you know, let's go and retire somewhere? No. We know that they would have to invent an enemy. I've used the example many times about the uh, the Kahal, you know, the Jewish communal system in the Polish Empire, um, especially in the 17th, 18th century. The Jewish communal system, of course, had complete dominance in, in Poland. And they kept the poor Jews in line, I mean, largely by complete separation from the Goyim, but by telling them that if they were able to, ever to convert, to leave the Kahal, to go, you know, become one of them, that they'd be killed, that the Goyim are, are drunken animals. And I could, I could go through, I mean, letter after letter from rabbis, Talmudic rabbis at the time, saying this. This is not a secret. Um, and it's how they kept people in line. And if they need to invent an enemy, they'll do it. Um, one rabbi whose name isn't, isn't coming to me said, actually not too long ago, that if um, we didn't have the Gentiles, we'd end up killing each other. That's the narcissistic personality. And these things aren't just occasional traits. They're the deep underlying hard wiring of their personality. Now, that's not to say, by any means, that every single person that supports uh, liberalism, in the broad sense of the term, is like this. Many of them are. Many of them are simply ignorant. Many of them are brainwashed. Many of them are frightened. Many of them, because we live in a regime of mass censorship, really don't know any better. Now, the connection between the psychological narcissistic state on the one hand and the ruling class on the other is pretty clear. Any trait of the narcissist, which I've just explained, is easily manifest in the ruling class. This is how they function. These people will talk about love and tolerance, and in the very same conversation, will talk about destroying nationalism, destroying their enemies, humiliating white people, banning Christianity. They have no problem in saying this. Especially over the last year, they are more obnoxious about it than ever. Because the more power they get, the more arrogant they get. And the more insulated they are from reality. One of the things that the narcissistic personality does, and one of the ways you could really identify it, narcissistic personality, they're not sociopaths. They do have a conscience. That conscience, however, is deeply buried. They hate the fact that they have a conscience because they know and they're well aware that this stuff really isn't true. Or certainly not to the extent they believe it. That these are weapons. 
This is destruction. This is about their own mental state and not the nature of reality. They know this. Exposing them, defeating them in debate, you know, putting out articles and books showing how absurd they are, is the worst thing you can possibly do because it continually reminds them what they really are. The narcissist knows that he's not extraordinary. He knows that he's not uh, worthy of admiration. In fact, just the opposite. So what do they do? Both in the political and in the individual level, they surround themselves with yes-men. Weak personalities that tell them what they want to hear. People who disagree, people who point out what they really are, they have numerous tactics, we'll get to that in a minute, as to how they eliminate them from their lives. You know, some form of, um, we use the term flying monkey. The flying monkey is somebody who is kind of ignorant about the nature of the narcissist who's then used to humiliate and marginalize those who identify the narcissist for what they really are. This happens all the time. The flying monkey is a usually an unknowing foot soldier. And that's the person that we're coming across, whether it be in verbal or you know, social media debate. Um, and so many of them are really unaware of the situation that they're in. You know, most people are extremely ignorant. You know, I spent decades, you know, in grad school as a professor, going over the most profound, the most uh, uh, extraordinarily powerful arguments, whether it be history or metaphysics, getting into every detail from Plato to Hegel. Uh, to Nietzsche, to, to you know, the Russian nationalists, all this, only to learn that when you go out into the even the educated world, you're dealing with ignoramuses, people who have no idea that there's anything in the world other than their passions and drives, people who have constructed their own world from their own projections. It is institutionalized, institutionalized neurosis. And that's the nature of post-modernity. That's uh, the world that we are forced to live in. Logic, reason, base, the basic structure of cognition is gone. Very rarely do you come across it anymore. That's the situation that we find ourselves in. If you're going to cut people off from the spiritual realm, from Plato's realm of the forms, from Logos, from the church, whatever it is, you have to destroy that part of the brain, or I should say the mind, this has nothing to do with the brain, the, the mind, which is not a physical thing, that connects to the spiritual realm. The, the Logoi, the forms, the archetypes, um, with which we understand the world objectively have to be denied and destroyed and of course those who accept them have to be denied and destroyed too the so-called scientific method to the extent it had any validity at all is absolutely rejected the paradigms imposed on students in scientific uh, grad programs are extremely rigid, ideological, and ascientific. It is ideology. It is not science. It has nothing to do with empiricism. Again, they'll read someone like you know Thomas Kuhn, and they'll talk about uh, the nature of coercion here, and still turn around and talk about the sacredness of the scientific method, not seeing a contradiction. Yes, it's possible that some of these people are neurotic because they suffer from cognitive dissonance. Or, on the other hand, it's possible that they don't recognize cognitive dissonance, either because they're sociopaths or they simply don't have the mental capacity. Do not assume that everyone you come across is capable of reason. And if they're not capable of reason, or if they're capable of logic, of course, you know, my cat is capable of logic, it knows how to hunt a mouse. That doesn't mean it's intelligent. It might be devious. But that's not what I mean. Uh, reason is something different. 
you know, if I want to go get a drink of water, logic tells me what to do to get there. That's not reason. Reason explains why that's important and how that connects with everything else in the world. That's a totally different thing. Logic is a tool. Reason is a nature of reality. It's, it's the central, it's, it's, it's logos. Um, so you're dealing with people, you know, cognitive dissonance is something that, for example, in, in the times when I was younger, and I actually suffered with it, is an awful, awful thing. You can't function. You either have to destroy it, you know, eliminate it, as I did, as best as we can, or somehow internalize it. And if you internalize it, you will become intensely neurotic. I've been at this nonstop for um, last month is 31 years. And I've spent every day of my life debating somebody, whether it be, especially now with, with you know, social media um, or in person, which I'm starting to really, I don't like the idea of in-person debates. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, social media, uh, writing essays, that kind of thing. It's been pretty much nonstop. If you guys get a minute, well, I'm going to talk about this maybe some other time, but go through the list of logical fallacies, especially the informal ones. That's key to understand uh, really the next, the next topic here, which is coming across these people in day-to-day -day life. We have no choice. There are people out there who either because they're in you know, bad faith, because they're brainwashed, because they're irrational, you're going to have to deal with them. Um, and I'm, I'm really the ideal situation here. We're talking about someone who you really don't know, who you're debating on social media. Now, the concept of debate is, is a separate issue because you guys have to know, I mean, don't mess with someone unless you really know your stuff. Don't mess with someone before you understand what makes them tick. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But so often our enemies, especially today, because they have everything, you know, they, they never even come across their opposition. You'll see a few similarities. And in my 30 years, this has been painfully obvious. Even if you point this stuff out, even if they tend to agree with you, you'll come across the same person a year later saying the same thing. Don't assume that people are rational. Don't assume that people care about the truth of the matter. It's a mistake that I made for a long time. Don't assume that people are like you. Don't assume that they're scrupulous, rational, that they care about truth, or will ever fight fair. Generally speaking, it isn't going to happen. As the education system collapses, as reason itself is denied, power is the only thing left, liberal ideology is violently imposed, and every classroom, every publishing house, every website, every media organization, every church, the people who we're dealing with are getting stupider. They're getting more arrogant. They're getting more ignorant. But there are a few things you may find that they have in common. And you need to know this stuff going in, or the way you deal with them is going to fail miserably. The first thing that you'll notice is they tend to argue in bad faith. Um... They generally don't care about or even try to understand what you have to say. Sometimes they don't understand the language that you're using. You know, I, I've, I'm, uh, for years I've been talking about how the word democracy has been totally redefined. It's not a procedure for electing leaders. It's liberal ideology. You know, I was removed from Facebook, numerous other removed from jobs. I was called officially a threat to democracy, which is 
one of the great achievements of my life. It's on my CV. It's really one of my titles. But, I mean, I'm opposed to the, you know, general election of, of, of the executive uh, in general, um, certainly in the sense that, that modern liberals understand it. But, of course, certainly even more than that, I'm opposed to liberal ideology for a whole bunch of reasons. And I've spent the last 30 years explaining that in, in great detail. The bad faith is the first thing you have to assume. They are dedicated, it seems, to almost deliberately misunderstanding and mischaracterizing what you're about to the point of absurdity, to the point of absolute destruction. And again, I'm increasingly convinced that they are dedicated to destruction for destruction's sake. You know, when you ask them what they're building, they rarely have a rational answer. They won't give you any. They'll say, talk about, you know, whether it be individualism. They'll talk about um, equality. You know, but these are very vague, abstract terms that can mean anything. Um, and if you begin asking them what these terms mean, you will find yourself in this very same situation. The people who we're dealing with often are just not equipped to have mature discussions. And they certainly have no idea how to resolve conflicts. Um, because the concept of expertise has gone out the window, and even those in the academy are so um, dominant, dominated by leftist ideology, the terms and the concepts and the arguments are always changing. But even they're flying monkeys. They'll use terms, they'll use arguments, they'll talk about methods, you know, the scientific technique and all this other stuff. You know, they've kind of heard about these things, but they don't understand them. And they're convinced that they're being reasonable and, and uh, fully logical. When you begin, and if you do this properly, and you begin calmly taking apart their ideology, they will become extremely upset and aggressive. And what they'll do is they'll deflect. You then become irrational, unreasonable, whatever it is. The concept of education in America in 2021 to be educated is to be liberal. These are some of the same people that will talk about how awful it is to characterize people in terms of groups and then talk about black power and um, Jewish interests and how much they hate the rednecks. Again, having no clear concept that that's a contradiction. Either they don't believe it in the first place, which is often the case, or they don't have the capacity to understand. You're discussing these things on social media. Remember, the person who you're arguing with, they're not really your concern. If nothing, they're nothing more than a pretext. You lay out the argument as calmly and as dispassionately as you possibly can, understanding that other people are going to be reading this. I don't like verbal debates very much because when someone gives you an argument, a verbal debate, you'll be expected to immediately respond. Well, that's irrational. If someone gives me an argument worthwhile, I want to think about it. I want to go to my sources. I want to go to their sources. Now, that's pretty rare you get an argument like that. But that's the ideal situation. You can't immediately formulate something in a split second. What it ends up being is whoever has the best one-liner and the best quip who makes the audience laugh. And, of course, I tend to be able to do this, but that doesn't convert anybody. Or the people that will convert, we don't want. They're unable. They're really unwilling to have a mature conversation. And, in fact, they're not even sure why such a conversation exists, because it's so obvious that they should be 
uh, in the dominant group. Sometimes you'll see what amounts to an incoherent, I don't know, um, amalgamation of, you know, fallacies, of misrepresentations, of errors, and often very emotional kind of uh, verbiage. Narcissists are known for this is called uh, word salad, which is, uh, you know, sometimes you'll you'll hear a, a speech from one of these people where they throw ten accusations all in like a few sentences, all in the most ridiculous emotional reasoning, having no conception of the even the language that they're using. The purpose isn't to give a logical argument. The purpose is to wear you down. The purpose is to confuse you and to make you seem ridiculous. And really it comes down to, especially in 2021, the use of provocations and bullying. Again, bully is one of these words that has been completely redefined, manipulated, but it certainly does exist. The regime and those it dominates have all the power and all the money. Those who oppose it are bullied just by our very existence. You can't bully an equal. Some of the worst things that you can do to these, it's like awakening a sleepwalker. Exposing their absurdity. It's probably best to not be in their physical presence. If you're dealing with a schizophrenic and, and you kind of tear apart their make-believe reality, you better get out of the way. You burst their bubble, and you do it with a great degree of skill. You may well be in dangerous territory. Um, maybe 80% of the discussions you're going to be in, you're going to deal with name-calling, emotional language, uh, attempts to deliberately hurt you, to lie, to make up stories. And, of course, behind it all is the idea of physical aggression in prison. You know, the, the situation with Donald Trump, um, how the press, how the media dealt with him, really changed everything. There is nobody in American history that's treated the way he was. I have um, I did shows some time ago where I listed the completely made-up, invented stories that CNN and, you know, all these, you know, silly CSNBC and all these, uh, the oligarch, you know, handful of oligarch media companies created and threw with Donald Trump. They're invented. They have no factual foundation. My Patreon page and other things, I have lists and lists of all of these things. And sometimes they're fully, you know, they're aware of this. In the George Zimmerman case, if you remember, where CNN deliberately spliced his words to have him say something that he didn't say. And yet today, even in university textbooks that cover this in sociology, they'll use the spliced and make-believe language. Because they may have admitted, CNN did admit, uh, to inventing his, his you, know, you know, using technology to, to splice his words and to change everything. They admitted it. Someone was symbolically fired. But... That was quickly forgotten. You need to remember that the American mass has a very short memory. And it's not crazy to say that as they're eulogizing the policeman harmed in what happened in, um, uh, in the Capitol, they really may just not remember that they were calling for the deaths of policemen back in July. In August, not just their deaths, but the um, the funding of their departments, that has almost completely been forgotten. And you even have calls for beefing up police departments so long as they're used against us. The blatant, well, I mean, they they certainly forget when I first got started in this in the early nineties. Fighting so-called conservative censorship was the big liberal agenda. Of course, we never had any kind of power to censor anybody. But the very idea that pornography should be tightly banned 
controlled and smashed um, was considered terrible censorship, as if James Madison wrote the First Amendment to protect, um, you know, um, a scumbag who just died, Larry Flint. That's what they were concerned with. What they want to ban is exactly what people like James Madison wanted to protect, debates over science and politics and philosophy, debates that now are banned in, and illegal in many parts of the world. Scientific journals will not publish anything that, for example, supports uh, any kind of creationism. It doesn't matter how good it is, it opposes the agenda, and now that's normal, that's policy. Many of you know that my big accusation and one of the things we have to keep in mind when dealing with these people is the constant use of lying and especially changing definitions. We talk about, for example, what happened over the summer. They'll say it never happened, that these protests were peaceful, that no one was armed, that no policemen were hurt or killed. That there's no massive increase. I think the murder rate in, in American cities has gone up over 200% in some places just last summer. They'll deny it. They'll say it didn't happen, that we're making it up, and that we should be put in prison. The line between denial and delusion is very thin. And in doing that, especially with the media behind them, the banking establishment behind them, universities behind them, um, and the threats of physical violence, and even jail, and losing your job. That constant hammering ultimately leads to us, some of our uh, people being, so starting to deny themselves, denying their own experiences. Maybe I didn't see that stuff over the summer. Maybe, and then, you know, they were confused, their morale collapses, and they become a almost a hypnotic wreck. And the technical term for that, some of you have heard of it, is gaslighting. The idea of gaslighting is, um, it also has to do with, with moonlight. That the light that comes from the moon, that comes from the old um, gas, um, gas-powered gas streetlights. You see this actually in, in Dostoevsky and Gogol, in Nevsky Prospect and, and their stuff in St. Petersburg. They talk about how the lanterns alter people's appearances um, they hold the notion of this the lunar um, the light that reflected from the moon um, completely is, is almost hypnotic it, 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 you don't see the way that the light reflects on people and objects makes them look totally different in the moonlight than they would in the sunlight that's become a, a trope in, in literature especially in Russian literature gaslighting refers to the older um, artificial lamps casting a very strange kind of glow onto people that make them look different. Moonlight is very much that way. It's the difference between moonlight and sunlight. The sun is the same. It's powerful. It's direct. The moon is always changing. The moon is deceptive. The moon is really, it's not even, it's like half light. It's not, you know, it doesn't flood the, the uh, planet like, like the sun does. It's very incomplete, and so it's easy to be fooled. That's the nature of... I mean, the gaslighting is really almost a summary of what we're dealing with every day. I've already come across people denying that policemen were killed this summer, or that people were advocating the slaughter of policemen and white people, that blacks who have killed white people have gone and, you know, we, we've come, it's been censured online, but we certainly have cases where they have, uh, you had very light prison sentences or no prison sentence at all. Um, again, it's delusion. They'll redefine terms and ideas to suit their, suit their story. They'll use euphemisms. They'll redefine words, especially commonly used words, to fit their story. When it, when, it, when it normally wouldn't. All they care about is justifying the regime, their own actions, and what they're saying, and largely because what they're saying is done through force. We're not entirely sure to what extent they really believe this nonsense, 
or whether they have to believe this nonsense. And if they have to believe this nonsense, how long does it take before they begin to actually really believe it? Thus, through repetition and because of censorship, they're not really seeing the opposing side. So many of our people are so incompetent and they're so presumptuous, they try to argue something they're not in any position to argue, that they make us look bad. Please, pick your battles. If you're going to go to war, and you know, uh, you know, intellectual war, please have it be something that you know about, an area that you really worked on, something that you could do a lot of good. You have to have a goal. Here's what I'm trying to do. Um, and my God, please. And I know, and I've, I've failed in this respect a hundred times. And it's something that a lot of us um, have to have to work on. Do not get sucked in to their word salad and get angry or depressed or, or, or whatever it is. It's very difficult to stick to the point when you're dealing with people who really have no idea with what sticking to the point is or why anyone should care. We're living in an age of mass official censorship. Therefore, you have more and more people who literally don't know that there's another side. And you see sometimes they, they look at you like you have a head growing out of your neck. You know, um, when you mention something. It's, it's that sometimes, again, you're, you're using words that they're not even familiar with. What we know as liberalism and leftism, they think is just how everything is. Um, another method that you're going to see is what we call deflecting. Or deflection and projection. These are defense mechanisms. Um, they're usually, you know, they come from Freud. They're pretty simple. Again, there's really nothing in psychology that's all that deep. It really isn't. Um, it was when it was a part of philosophy. It certainly was. Um, um, you know, that's why you get a PhD in psychology. It's still a doctor of philosophy. But um, because they, they're nominalists and they use, you know, statistical methods and all that, it doesn't get very deep. You don't get any deep knowledge through statistics um, and through quantity. But still, they're useful ideas. Um, to deflect is to have some vague realization that what they're doing is wrong. And rather than deal with their problem, they then turn it around and say, you're doing this exact same thing. They'll never take responsibility for their behavior. And that exists at the state level, and that exists at the individual level. As far as the state is concerned, state policies over the last 40 years have destroyed the family, have destroyed religion, have destroyed manufacturing, have destroyed unions. And the very people who constructed these policies will never repent. They'll never realize what they did rather than do that and suffer the consequences. They will lie, they'll tell stories, but most importantly, they'll accuse you of doing the exact same thing. People who've defended the oligarchs, the Jewish oligarchs who have ruled Ukraine, for example, and Russia in the 1990s to the point of mass poverty, they defended those people, they financed those people, they'll turn around and talk about how someone like Putin is backed by the oligarchs. All they're doing is deflecting. Projection is when they take their own um, toxic behaviors and vices and act as if and assume that we have those very same vices because they're dishonest, because they lie on a regular basis, they assume that we do too. We are not equals. We're forced to be uh, by the nature of the system, but we're not. We don't do what they do. Um, you bring up something that's, you know, false or a lie or a double standard. A rational person will address the issue. They'll take responsibility for it. They'll change their point of view. But I've done this many times. No, the irrational, immature, the um, soy boys, we call them, 
they'll go into attack mode. They'll deflect. They don't know how to look at themselves. Just like you can't assume that people care about truth. You can't assume that people are rational. You also can't assume that people know how to be introspective. They don't know how to look at themselves. Looking at yourself objectively is difficult. Um, it's actually very painful. But since people will do anything, generally speaking, to avoid discomfort, although that's very simplistic too, they'll avoid introspection. A lot of these people really, they can't be alone with themselves. Their conscious is so twisted, um, and, but, but it's still there. You know, the whole notion of, of the judgment in the Orthodox uh, faith, the notion of the judgment is not so much that God has this list of laws, like a, like a judge, and he, you know, pronounces sentence. That's a metaphor. God knows what's happening. There's no judgment. You don't use the, you know, the, the metaphor of a, of, a, of a modern court. God forbid. No, you're the one that does the judging. The difference in, 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 in the next life is that you can't lie. Because God knows all, you can't tell a story, whether to yourself or to anyone else. Here you have a good lawyer to manipulate the jury. You can't do that in the judgment. The only thing that's judged is your own conscience, and you do the judging. You won't be allowed to tell stories. You won't be allowed to deflect, to project. You won't be allowed to threaten, to throw people in prison, to uh, attack them, to, to send uh, uh, your goons after them. You won't be allowed to do that. You'll be forced to do what you, they refused. What we all, re many of us refuse to do here on earth. Look at yourself. Everything is open. There's no veil anymore. There's no self justification. There's no, you know, you can't turn the TV up to uh, avoid dealing with things. You can't do that in the judgment. You are judged by yourself. Your conscience finally is laid bare. Your conscience is finally able to operate with no hindrance. That's what the judgment is. There is no more bad faith. You can't lie anymore. Lying is, of course, institutionalized, but overwhelmingly people lie to themselves. So many, especially in this in the situation that we're talking about, they're lying, but they're not aware that they're lying. It's because they spend so much time lying to themselves that they've come to believe these things is true. This is some of the basic foundations of, of neurosis. Things that psychology has no, I mean, they, they're not in any, they, they simply are, because they're part of the regime, they're, they're institutionalized, they can't talk about this stuff. So many of these guys, I can picture these professors of psychology reading about a narcissist having no idea that they're talking about them. These pompous uh, uh, idiots talking about Plato or Gogol, God forbid. Um, you know, my favorite writer, the greatest Russian writer, in my opinion. Um, having no idea that they're the ones that are being excoriated in these words. They simply don't have the capacity to look at themselves. They can't. You kind of wonder why people, particularly your know, friends, people you know, why they attack you, why they make fun of you, why they reject you, no matter how rational you are, no matter how little they know. Why the rejection? Especially in such vehement terms. And something like the Holocaust. Why, why that in particular? Why that? Of all the, the alleged crimes that you can deny, why is that, you know, met with such vehement derision? And not anything else. Well, we all know the reason, of course. The reason is, if they accept reason and evidence, if they actually acted like the scientific method they pretend to believe in, their life, as they know it, would be over. Because once you come to the knowledge of truth, you're now in trouble. You'll end up like Socrates, like Christ, like the prophets, like so many of the new martyrs. Because once you know the truth, now there's no excuse. You can't hide it. I understand that a lot of our people have no choice 
but to lay low for a while. That's understood so long as they support people who aren't lying low. Sorry, laying low. I can't speak English. Um, it's okay to not be able to do anything right now so long as you support those of us who are. We understand that. And how are that's going to work out psychologically later, that's a whole separate issue, but um, I understand that. And no one should be condemned for not being able to be, you know, out in front and, um, you know, marching to your neighbor's house, calling them, calling them um, uh, frauds. Uh, we understand that that's often not possible, but you then have the responsibility of supporting those who actually do that. Um, which is, by the way, exactly what the prophets did in the Old Testament. There's a reason why the Old Testament is increasingly ignored. And, and one day, I, I've made this prediction, I'm going to keep doing it. It will be banned. It will be removed from the Bible. They'll talk about, you know, racism and everything else. They'll have like three or four Psalms and like ten Proverbs, and that'll be all that's left. That's going to be gone. I guarantee it. It's going to because it's no one no, no one understands it anyway. No one talks about it. No one gets it. Um, it's so violent and 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 nationalist and, and and socialist in the true sense. Everything that the regime is against, there is no way. And it's simply, it's simply ignored. You know these these pseudo intellectual Christians going around like ask him about Le what Leviticus is about. Don't talk to me about the Bible until you actually understand it. Not just a few of the, what you think are easy to understand slogans from the Gospels. Explain to me what the symbolic, what, what does the number two mean? Is it two of something? And in their ignorance, they really believe that. They think number two is two of something. I have one thing, I have two things. That's what number two is. And it's so difficult to keep from just pummeling the person. Hoping maybe that will, you know, bring them to some coherence. We can't do that. Um, we can't do that. We can't do what Elijah did. Um, but rather, we could do something far worse. The worst thing we can do, as far as they're concerned, is to be calm and cool, ignore their provocations, and lay out in detail why they're wrong. Then they have a choice to make. Once they realize that they can't get you anymore, and what they do, I don't know, you know, they threaten you, who knows. But once they can't go uh, any further, once they simply lose, and, and it's key that you remain calm, just let the crap flow over you. You know what they're going to say, and you know why they're saying it. The worst thing you can do is stay calm and take apart their assumptions. Burst the bubble. And the reason that's the worst thing you can do, opposed to just, you know, making them look foolish, although never humiliate them. Never humiliate. If you know more than somebody else, do not rub it in. That is a disaster. That is no way to function. You want to convert some of these people. No, um, it's the worst thing you can do because they then have to make a choice. Either I'm going to lie and pretend I didn't hear this stuff or I'm going to have to completely remake my life. The minute you start talking like, like I do, there's no way you could have a normal job. You can't have normal friends. You can't go to cocktail parties and act like everything is fine. You now have an obligation in one way or another to tell the truth, knowing full well what's going to happen to you. That's just how it is. Now, again, assuming they're not sociopaths, and there's millions of sociopaths out there, a sociopath has no conception, there's no good or evil, there's no truth or falsehood, there's no beauty or ugly, it's all one mass. It's a mass of gray. They're miserable people. They're actors. They're manipulators, but they're miserable people. There's no good, there's no bad, there's no happiness, there's no sadness. They simply exist. Assuming they're not that, they're going to have to live in utter misery because they know the truth and they're not going to be able to talk about it. Or, of course, they withdraw themselves from society as much as humanly possible and change their lives. 
Well, they're not going to do that. So they'll lie to themselves. They'll attack you. They'll call you names. They'll do whatever they can. And it comes ultimately from, as I said early on, bad faith. The regime depends on irrationality. It depends on lying. It depends on neurosis, deflection, projection. It is institutionalized narcissism. It's narcissism writ large. Anyway, this is um, serves as kind of an introduction to this topic. Uh, it is absolutely essential. We deal with this. Next time, I want to talk about how we're to function as human beings in this toxic, sick system. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Part 2 of Narcissism, The Regime and Our Sanity Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition. This is Matthew Raphael Johnson, and it is March 3rd, 2021. As always, I want to thank my, my donors and my friends. Um, as our struggle gets worse and worse as time goes on, um, this kind of support for all of us who are fighting this battle full time is, is, uh, is essential. Um, not just support for me personally, but also for Radio Albion. And I, I, I want to, um, mention Sven Longshanks. I don't think a lot of people realize the huge amount of work that this now very large network requires. He's doing almost all the work himself. He is, um, doing it with very little money. Very little support and the hours are very long. And it's that kind of work ethic, um, under, you know, constant attack from the regime that requires our support. And if you can't do it financially, at least, um, rhetorically, if one of our people are, are being attacked on um, whether it be Facebook or, or YouTube, don't avoid it. Say something in support, um, even if it's in the most general sense. And that's extremely important today. We really have no institutions. Um, last week we talked about the concept of narcissism, both as a psychological idea, which is simple enough, and its relationship to the regime. Um, the regime, as I've defined many times before, is a very technical term that I use all the time. It refers to how power, um, uh, the, the locus of power. The regime is a, a nexus, almost a, a matrix of both private and public sources of authority. It hits uh, everything from you know medicine to media to academics to manufacturing um, to politics, of course, in all senses of the term, international. And it's a relatively small group of people, extremely wealthy, um, who finance everything from NGOs to universities to hospitals. The people who you see in the list of the Bilderberg meetings, um, they come from all walks of life, but they have a few things in common. They have, they're liberal politically, every last one in a very broad sense. They are, um, millionaires or billionaires. They, um, are very isolated from ordinary people. Um, many of them are, in fact, narcissists and self-absorbed. They're very disturbed people in the sense that, um, you know, they're, they're never, they're never going to get enough. The power that they have is never going to be enough. If that were the case, they would simply take the billions they have and just retire. But they won't. It's never enough. And ultimately, these are very unhappy people. And I say it because no matter how much power they get, no matter how much, um, course of power that they're able to collect, um, it's never enough. They're never finished. They're always 
um, on the warpath or something. They're always disordered. They're always covering something up. And ultimately, it comes down to the fact that things can change very quickly. I use the example all the time of the Soviet Union. One day, roughly between 1989 and 1990, this huge colossus fell to pieces. There was not a war. There was no um, the economic or otherwise. The U.S. was you know, trading as it always did, freely with Gorbachev's empire. Um, and one day, all of a sudden, people noticed that the system is, was, was simply uh, dissolving. Now we can talk about the causes for that, but it's all post hoc kind of reasoning. But last week we dealt with the fact that we're dealing with people who aren't just incorrect. They're not just wrong factually. There's something wrong with them. We live, we live in an age of mass censorship where, and again, as I said, it's never enough. They are now openly talking about the destruction of anyone they disagree with. They're talking about the almost ritual humiliation of anyone that um, disagrees with them, and even a, a fairly minor area. They're constantly on the lookout. They're constantly reading things and, and reading into things. Um, the recent uh, controversy that Dr. Seuss spoke. Dr. Seuss was a leftist, of course. Um, but the point is, or the, the author of, the, of those books, but there's no real specific reason for this. They're doing it just to do it. They're doing it just to let everyone know that they're capable of this kind of evil. Uh, Amazon just went through another mass purge. But you would think to yourself, given the power that they have, given the, you know, almost unequaled uh, authority over others that they have, why are they so fanatical about this? What they're doing doesn't exactly come from people who are secure in their power. But again, using the Soviet example, they're never secure. Psychologically, they're aware that they have no right to rule, that they have no right, they haven't earned any of the money or the power that they have. No one could possibly earn, you know, trillions of dollars. They know that their regime can fall at any moment. No one really has faith in it. Um, the economy is, is not going to recover. There's no foundation for it to recover because there's no... Um, there's no manufacturing. There's no credit. They're aware of this. They're also aware that the bulk of the population, really of all races today, um, rejects the major media. Rejects, I mean, the major media is their number one um, source of power. Right now, without control of the media, they have nothing. This is what we do here, why it's so important. And because they realize that this can, you know, um, go wrong at any moment, they are getting more and more fanatical. Last week, we talked about narcissism, not just as a psychological phenomenon, but both as a spiritual one and a political one. As I said before, psychology is a very, very weak field. Psychology used to be a philosophical discipline up until, you know, the late enlightenment. The social sciences essentially take well, the two master disciplines, which are philosophy and history. Everything comes from those two. You know, theology is on top because that's the ultimate purpose of everything. Uh, you can't get, you know, you can't go beyond God. And then the two master secular fields are philosophy and history. Everything, every field, every thought, comes from both of those, because even historical studies have to have a philosophical background. They have to have a, a set of axioms that they start from, and um, philosophy is always historical. It has to start in a specific time and place and have uh, topics to deal with that are important at the time. So in, all, in many ways, it's really one field. 
These are the two master fields. What the social sciences tried to do is take a piece of this, make it fully quantitative, that is to say reduced to numbers, and um, make the claim, the epistemological claim, that that's what reality is. And you'll have positivists today that will say, if something is not operationalizable, that is reducible to numbers, or, um, or quantitative, it does not exist. That's the old scientific fallacy. Science can only deal with things that are based on physical cause and effect. Otherwise, they have no right to have an opinion on anything. Therefore, they say, well, because we have no power over it, it must not exist. We talked about narcissism last time in both of those um, both of those senses. We talked about how extremely important it is um, to understand it uh, psychologically and how it manifests itself politically. And one of the most important things to take from what we did last week is to understand that every so-called symptom, these aren't symptoms in the medical sense by any means, but every symptom that you see in the narcissistic personality has its almost immediate, it's not an analog, because these aren't analogies, they are actually, you know, um, uh, equal in terms of their reality. These, you know, I'm not, we're not just using words here. They have a political um, equivalence. So, for example, your typical narcissistic person believes themselves to be special. They believe themselves to be worthy of some kind of admiration for some set of reasons. That set of reasons, those reasons have to be false. I mean, if you're a genius and no one pays any attention to you, well, you have a right to be angry. The narcissist, because it's a, a, a pathology, can't be a genius. He just have to think. He has to think he, is, or want you to think he is, which is more important. And therefore, they deserve special treatment, and, and they're simply extraordinary people, and you really have to just learn from them, and, and, and they shouldn't really even be dealing with, with commoners. And the regime is the exact same way. They believe themselves to be the end of history, as the Marxists thought. One of the many connections between capitalism and Marxism is that they both believe, and they're, they're very similar ideologies, capitalism and Marxists believe that they're at the end of history that they are the solution to all the problems of the Enlightenment. Uh, because of that, they have almost a theological right to rule. The problem with these kind of myths, the stories that they tell themselves, is that at some level, outside of the sociopath, because they have no connection there, they, they, don't, they don't have any conscience, but the narcissist does have a conscience. It's deeply buried, and the conscience, as I've said, says that this is all nonsense. There's that famous debate that we've had for decades now. Do these people really believe this crap? Or is it just very lucrative for them to believe this crap? And then over time, they start believing their own press. For the most part, that's not entirely relevant. The people who we deal with every day, that's a different story. Um, and that's what the regime, that's why it does what it does. They tell themselves a story. It's a false narrative um, that they tell themselves over and over again. They censor anything that doesn't fit, and therefore um, they give themselves this ridiculous right to rule. Um, another um, trait is exploitation. Because the narcissistic personality doesn't recognize the reality of other people. They have no conception of what it, what they do to people. They have no really ability to understand how they make people suffer. Um, and what difference does it make if they have this, you know, uh, status, you know, they're, they're Superman. They're the Nietzschean overman. And the regime is the exact same way. They don't know. They don't care, and they have no particular interest in how they have destroyed things. You know, the the handful of, of uh, Jewish economists that destroyed the Russian economy from 1990 to 1995, 
Most of them are still around. They teach at Ivy League schools. They're put on TV. They're called um, the most, you know, uh, laudatory names. And yet these people are really genocidal maniacs who cause the complete destruction and, and disintegration of an entire economy, such as it was. Harvard University, the economics department, we've been through this before. They have no conception of what they've done. Today, of course, because of censorship, it's really hard to get objective information. But even if they had it, it really doesn't matter. What frightens them, though, is that when we bring it up, and we bring it up over and over again, they know that we're out here. They know that we're doing this. And that's why they behave the way they do. That's why they freak out over the slightest deviation. The narcissistic personality is very much like that. So you have, you know, someone says a very mild criticism of, of, of the Jewish people, and they say, you want to put us in the ovens. This hysterical overreaction is a classic symptom of the narcissistic personality because they're so fragile. Their position is fragile. Their ego is fragile. They're on the verge of breakdown at any given moment mentally because they of this, of this cognitive dissonance. They'll react to even the slightest criticism uh, of their world, of their, of their um, self-image with hysterical denunciation. There you have a very clear connection between the narcissistic mind and, um, and the regime. What exists in soul, this disorder there, manifests itself in the disorder of the regime. This is one of the key platonic uh, axioms of, of political science. But we ended last week um, dealing with how we approach these people. And I was talking specifically about debating them. Today, that's getting more and more difficult. Partially because we're really not allowed to do that. Um, the regime has full control over all social media. And you have bots and, and actually real people scouring comments and debates for anything that may be um, counter-revolutionary. The Soviet Union did not have this level of technological surveillance. It really was pretty mild by comparison. Debating these people, uh, the so-called flying monkeys we talked about last week, is getting more and more difficult because, for, for a bunch of reasons. Reason number one, logic and reason are coming under attack. I thought these are, these are white male creations, including mathematics. There was a headline, you know, two plus two equals four is racist because this comes from white European mathematics. You, you've seen this before. American Renaissance covers this stuff all the time. Reason, uh, even the most basic empirical, um, thought processes are, 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 are under attack. If you have, number two, you have the absolute truth, as they all believe that they do, um, why be logical? Just, you know, these people need to be silenced, they need to be sent off to camps, they need to be, you know, lose their jobs, whatever. And no one's going to say anything to them when they do it. Number three, education now is so poor that even, you know, the teachers at all levels have no conception of reason. They don't, can't define it. They don't know what it is. They know logic, maybe. But ask them for, you know, a list of informal fallacies and, and they'll, they don't know what you're talking about. They'll, they'll report you to the FBI, which they are doing. They do it all the time. So when you have logic and reason coming under attack, um, which by the way is a narcissistic trait. We talked about gaslighting. The notion that, that the very cognitive process that you use to argue with them, that will come under attack. They'll throw so much at you, you know, emotion, um, um, threats, all with a smirk on their face, knowing full well that that power is behind them, and even claiming to be victims 
as I threatened you with, with, you know, losing everything. Almost with the notion that they're, they want you to do something. They want you to lash out because you can't do under any circumstances. Um, but I want to talk briefly about some of their techniques. We talked about it a little bit last week. Um, some of the fallacies that these, or really frauds that these people use, and it comes down to diversionary tactics. We talked about, you know, uh, gaslighting, we talked about projection. Um, the, the, the nonsense, the so-called uh, word salad, the, the circular conversations. Um, um, and of course, there's also, you know, blanket statements and wild generalizations. And it comes down to simple laziness. Again, if, if the entire regime is on your side, why even bother to think? These people are very soft. And because they're very soft, um, they can afford to, you know, throw out these ridiculous generalizations. They'll use terms like, you know, white supremacists or whatever. They don't know what it means. They couldn't define it. But they've been told, they actually believe that this is somehow evil. Whatever, whatever definition they have in their mind. And everyone who disagrees with them will be smeared with that brush, so don't worry about it. Um, this is, this is the very definition of toxicity. And the only thing you could do here is keep yourself focused on the point. Don't allow them to distract, and these are all diversionary tactics. Understand that they're being illogical. They're also trying to get a rise out of you. They're trying to get you to be angry, to do something. But I'm telling you now, the first person to lose their temper is the one who lost. If you stay cool, even if you don't, maybe don't know as much as, as the other person, you keep your cool, you stay calm, eventually they're going to lose it. It's really hard to have a, you know, a, a, let's say a social media debate within two or three responses. It's already personal and angry. People simply don't know how to think. They'll deliberately misrepresent you. And they'll do it to the point of absurdity. Um, they'll repeat your... This happens quite often. If you give an argument of any complexity, they're going to tend to... You probably won't understand it. Then what they're going to do is simply repeat it back to you themselves and then to you in a way that they understand. And in addition to that, they'll repeat it in a way that makes it seem ridiculous. I, to this day, continue to overestimate the mental ability of, of the people who I debate. They simply don't know how to make a basic logical argument. And of course, they, they know that to some extent, and they'll project it. I mean, they'll go even to the point where you're you know making points... And they'll say something like, oh, you must be perfect then. Oh, I must be a bad person. Everything I'm saying is wrong. Trying to read your mind, which is, by the way, one of the weakest forms of argument. Oh, you're just jealous kind of talk. They use a lot of mental health phrases. That you're, you're obsessed with something or that you're uh, paranoid. That's the old Soviet technique of delegitimizing somebody by claiming that they're mentally ill. That's an old um, a Soviet technique. And, of course, they had mental hospitals that were filled to the brim of normal people who disagreed with this. This is, you know, this is almost identical here. The prisons are absolutely bursting. There's not a big difference between the Soviet camps and these prisons. If you've ever even seen them, most people haven't even seen them. Um... Another technique that they'll use all the time is nitpicking. They realize that they're being outclassed. Again, they probably have never heard your point of view before. And then they'll pick something, uh, maybe a misspelling, they'll miss uh, a very minor um, logical lapse or something like that. Um, the, the sociopathic moving the goalpost uh, fallacy. Um, I mean, something, something silly. Um, you know, if you, if you point to the fact that you may be successful in some area, they'll point to someone who's more successful. Um, you know, they'll constantly move the goalpost. Um, that, you know, um, 
uh, try to make you feel that you're not enough. Uh, going after your morale, your sense of self is extremely common. You've all noticed the TV commercials have very, very few white people in them. What makes me laugh is that most of these are for products, you know, advanced computers or pickup trucks that have almost zero, um, uh, say black or, or, um, um, purchasing. You know, these expensive gaming systems and, um, uh, laptops and, and, you know, classic, you know, white nerd kind of thing. They have all these black, uh, um, models in, in, uh, in the ad. That is not their market. Well, since they're not their market, then what are they using them for? Other than sheer protection money. This is not what they have to do. I saw a commercial just today, in fact. The first time I saw a white man in a commercial in probably three, four days. It was a guy who was a father. It was, I think it was, um, it was an SUV commercial. And he was terrified standing on the bumper of his, of his SUV because it was a little animal. I forget what it was, but it was tiny. It was making fun of the guy. It's like George Costanza type. So I guess they do have white males and ants, this, that one. Um, the point there is to humiliate. Keep in mind something very important. The regime, the people who control the press, advertising, entertainment, they're already multi-billionaires. That's, you know, they're good no matter what happens. They have other sources of income other than what it is that they're dealing with. You know, people who control the media, a handful of people, mostly Jewish, they, they have other sources of income. They're invested all over the world in different things. The point is, they're willing to lose billions of dollars. Now, I've been saying this for... If you remember the, the Disney series, Nothing Sacred, about these, these corrupt uh, Catholic priests. I was back in college, in fact. I remember Rush Limbaugh talking about that. Um, and or Brent Bozell from the Media Research Center. I remember Brent, in fact, um, talking about that it's that no one watched it. In fact, they couldn't even get advertisers for it. They were using those, you know, uh, local, uh, you know, these local ads, these idiots, you know, car lots, whatever. And no one quite understood it because we're all taught to believe that these people just care about money and viewership and they'll do whatever, you know, their, their market wants. That's not the case. By now, most of you have read about the Golden Globes. Thank God. Their viewership this year was down 60%. The NFL, again, thank God, is collapsing. Another couple of years, they won't be able to, the salary cap's going to kill them. Now, I don't really follow, but it's very clear when they don't have much of it, you know, the, the old income stream. But it doesn't matter. They're aware that people are abandoning them. They're aware that whenever they bring in the propaganda, whenever they force that down people's throats, it could be NASCAR, it could be, it doesn't matter. People leave. Not just white people. The Golden Glows had a 60% decrease. Saturday Night Live, that used to be my, my favorite show of all time, at least a few years ago, lost 40% of their viewers over the, the Trump um, stuff and, and everything else. They're to the point now where they actually, they're, they're doing skits, which are actually ads for products. And it's built in to the skit itself. They're so low on funds that they have to do stupid things like that. You can't tell the difference now between a show and advertising. Which is, by the way, the, the wave of the future here. You'll see an episode of something and you'll see a few products, um, mentioned all the time. You see the name, whatever it might be. It could be a car, it could be, uh, food product. And what's happening is that they're paying for their uh, loss of viewership um, through um, product placement. Now, again, that doesn't last long. The point is, they're willing to lose money. 
they're willing to go bankrupt. Um, I mean, not, not not themselves, of course. It doesn't matter if they do or not. They have so many sources of income, and they have so much um, uh, hidden away in banks all over the world. What difference does it make? They could drive themselves into a media company to the ground. They have almost an infinite amount of resources to keep it going. They're willing to lose money. Now, how that's going to hold for the future, well, this is a short-term strategy, of course. What's going to happen in the future? I don't know. Um, using you know, advertisements as actual shows and drama and comedy. Um, the line now is gone. That's probably a short-term strategy. And if there's no one watching, then the advertisement doesn't do much. They evade accountability. They use every kind of threat. Imaginable name-calling is, is simple, but it's very common. They with something called destructive conditioning where they, they will associate your strengths, your abilities, even even good memories. They'll associate it with abuse, with frustration, with, with contempt. They will attack you know qualities that they once celebrated. They'll ruin you know a celebrations, holidays. You see this in relationships, you see it in the regime by taking, you know, trying to uh, keep the retail significance of Christmas just without mentioning Christmas in it. Isolating friends and family. All of this stuff. What the, what, what the narcissist type does at the personal level, the regime is doing every day at the political level. Over time, you're trained to become afraid of doing even the most basic things. And without money, it's going to be more and more difficult to function at any level. So every, even the little things that we took for granted are now under attack. And of course, if all else fails, they use smear campaigns. They will keep us under surveillance. But there's also the concept, and this, this comes up quite often, what's called love bombing. Now that's on a personal level. Um, for the, the excessive flattery. You may see an officially sponsored, vaguely conservative persona that suddenly will get all this adulation because once in a while he may say something kind of edgy. Nothing too bad, but once in a while. And when that happens... Your response will be that, well, maybe things aren't so bad. This guy's going. This guy seems is, is not being censored. Now, this is this is simply how it works. It exists on the personal level. It exists on the level of the regime. I'm wondering if Elon Musk is is now being positioned to put in that category. On the other hand, someone like him can be the foundation of a new movement. I mean, they're oligarchs. They're just or even you know Trump is an I mean, they're they're distorted to begin with to be at that level. But because they're extremely strong personalities, you anger them enough. And I don't know what they're capable of. The regime, however, has um, a trem- just a huge number of weapons. Um, so the fallacies that they use, the methods that they use, um, you have to be aware of all of this. You have to be able to see it, identify it, and then, in fact, call it out. Fallacies are extremely important. Most of you know what a straw man is. The straw man is one of the most important techniques that the regime uses. They're even to the point now where they're doing it in academic journals. It's when they create a caricature of your point of view. They, re- as I mentioned before, they'll repeat back your point of view in a distorted way. They'll exaggerate it. They really make a character of the whole thing, and then that's what they attack. So, for example, they really believe that any criticism of the illegal immigration, or any immigrant, you know, America doesn't need any immigrants. Illegal immigration is another diversion. All immigration is a problem right now. There's no need for another immigrant for in, in history, from here on in, in the U.S. There's absolutely no need for them. Um, um, so el- the illegal uh, legal distinction is that's the you know neocon uh, diversion. 
but they'll take even the slavery. When Donald Trump first ran for office in 2016, his criticism of illegal immigration was no different than Bill Clinton's in the 90s. He was very calm and moderate, but they created a caricature. They created a straw man. They created a, a, a Donald Trump that doesn't actually exist. They'll create the guy, uh, uh, they'll, they'll, you know, uh, uh, provide him with all kinds of, of ridiculous opinions. They'll invent stories of all kinds of, uh, manipulated photographs. They'll call him every name imaginable because it's all based, according to them, on blind hate. There's no good reason to be opposed to their agenda. Uh, Jewish oligarchy to, uh, un, you know, immigration, the migrant invasion in, in Europe over the last few years. There's no good reason to reject that. Therefore, it's blind hate. And that's the caricature that they'll actually approach in your day to day life. Those supporting the regime see you that way. And as mass censorship becomes more and more common and, you know, is more and more institutionalized, these people actually won't know any better. They'll see you as someone who's, by their own estimation, um, demented. How does this guy not see that to be opposed to um, uh, the system is, is insanity? Liberalism right now doesn't see themselves as an ideology. They see themselves as reality. That's been going on for some time. But the higher you go up the, the scale of power, the more and more uh, isolated they are. This was the case in the Soviet Union, too. That elite party members rarely came across any other idea, any other concept, or any other person. I mean, the, the oligarchical families usually only marry each other. They're deeply inbred. They're entirely and completely isolated, even genetically so, from people on the ground. So it's not a matter of believing a liberal point of view because they compare it with everything else. They believe it because they don't know anything else. It's not, you know, they, they, the idea of, say, the isolated individual or, um, um, you know, mass immigration, uh, Jewish oligarchy. These things are not only, it's not, it's not a matter of um, principal debate. That's simply how it is. Um, right-wingers are, are insane, mental case white supremacists. And they have this emotional response to that. You question the Judaic Holocaust, you are a psychotic who needs to be put in prison. And they do say that. They say it all the time. Denying that or rejecting it or even questioning it is illegal in most countries of, of Europe right now. They think that this isn't a matter of debate. They think that's simply how it is. That's that's a brute fact. You have to be absolutely essential. This is absolutely essential for you. You have to be very much aware of this. And because they think that liberalism is a reality, not one point of view among others, um, they don't see any need to do anything other than appeal to authority. Um, um, equivocation, uh, appeals to popularity, what they think is popularity. Um, the appeal to ignorance, for example. And, of course, as always, the appeals to emotion, you know, pity or affection, uh, question begging, uh, the false dilemma. Um, so a false dilemma, for example, in the Holocaust stuff, they'll say, um, either you, know, you reject the notion of, of this you know, Jewish genocide on the one hand, or you totally accept it. Black or white, nothing in between. So you have to deny camps, you have to deny any, any reference to, to Jews in official pronouncements. You have to deny the existence of any uh, forced labor camp anywhere, as opposed to somewhere in the middle, um, where you're questioning uh, the, the dogma, but not necessarily at every every single level. Of course, lots of Jews were killed. Of course, camps existed, existed, but certainly not in the way that they say, and not for the reasons that they say. But the minute you start getting detailed, even something like that, is 
gets too complicated. You start going down that path in front of them. They see that you're making a, a good argument. You're doing it calmly. You're doing it rationally. To defend themselves, they're going to insert a thought-stopping cliche. Oh, this guy's just a white supremacist. Whatever the slogan is at the moment. That's designed not to shut you up, but to shut their own thought process up. Um, and it goes on and on. A slippery slope is a big uh, fallacy. Um, hasty generalization. Um, you know, faulty analogies. Or even the idea that just because um, the logic in an argument might be false, therefore the conclusion is false, which is not necessarily the case. one after another after another, and these come from the decay of education, the decay of basic thought. When your point of view is conflated with reality, it's not even a point of view, it's just how things are. If you have the power of the regime behind you in every way, why are you going to study something? It used to be that the regime would talk about relativism, Relativism is, is, you know, college, fresh, college freshman, uh, most ridiculous, lazy, um, uh, it's the negation of thought. Because the minute you start thinking that, you know, moral, uh, behaviors are relative, they're not really good, they're not really bad, they might be useful or, or, or not useful, but that's it, then why worry about it? If there's no consensus, or even, the ability to know doesn't exist. Why worry about it? Why would you study something that there's no truth to or truth is impossible? Now that's gone. In the 80s, 90s, relativism was the liberal point of view. That is gone. Now they are promoting the most intense uh, absolutism down to the, the most, the slightest um, detail of your behavior. Every move you make is under regime surveillance because every move you make um, can uh, lead you in court. Liberalism is totalitarian, as Alexander Dugan says, because it um, it's based on capital, it's based on conglomerates, it's based on oligarchy, and um, because of the conflation of public and private sources of power, there is nothing that you can do or say that is it amenable to regulation. Because private and public have collapsed, that distinction doesn't exist anymore. You don't have a single source of power. One of the great absurdities, and there's so many of them, but one of the great ones is that only governments are capable of repressing somebody. Now, if the private sector can destroy your livelihood, can shut down your bank account, as they're doing now. Take away your, you know, credit cards, as they did with the Barnes Review not too long ago. Um, shut down your, your books at Amazon, whatever, whatever it might be. That's probably more effective than the prosecution from the state. There's no, um, presumption of innocence. There's no, um, uh, uh, procedure. There's no court case. They simply cut you off, and they've destroyed livelihoods by the thousands solely on the basis of not being immediately conformist in every respect, and I mean in every respect. To be one of our people in a powerful position right now has got to be terrifying because the slightest deviation will uh, get you removed, and this is an unfortunate fact. We talk about narcissism, and it's something that um, is worth discussing. The uh, story itself, the uh, story of, of um, Narcissus and Echo, Narcissus, I should say, an Echo from Ovid, the Metamorphosis, uh, the third book, it doesn't get discussed all that much. 
especially by psychologists who don't even know where this stuff really came from. When you like all, or, or like they do all the time when they when they describe something like this, something out of their field is usually disaster. It's just you know three or four lines trying to summarize what happened. But it goes to show that this stuff has been around long before the social sciences were. It's just stated in a different way. The ancients were far more rational in their understanding of psychology than today, which is completely dominated by psychology, or in all the social sciences, especially economics. Narcissus um, comes from really the primal, the primal god. Sophisius, um, the river god, which is a very primal entity, and a nymph, Stereope. That's his parents. And by the way, um, he's a result of rape. Stereope was was uh, was raped by the river god, at least uh, by uh, most of the versions of the story. So you already have problems even before the story begins. Um. Now, Leope, uh, Leope brings um, baby Narcissus to Tiresias, who shows up all over the place in Greek mythology, and already at a very young age is extraordinarily attractive. People can't get their eyes off the guy. And because the nymph, his mother, is worried about this, is very interested in, in the, the destiny that this guy has, brings him to Tiresias, and Tiresias says, and the translations differ here, if he but fail to recognize himself, a long life he may have beneath the sun. Which at the time was seen as a very odd, uh, all would cause it uh, frivolous. Some translations say, um, not recognize himself, but know himself. If he doesn't recognize himself, if he doesn't know himself, he'll be okay. Um, and, and so you are, you start off with the rape. You start off with, um, the primal, uh, primal back of the river god being this, this primal urge, of course, and a nymph as a mother. Uh, you already have, have problems. And we'll see here in a minute that the entire concept of Narcissus and Echo uh, is based on a lack of communication. Now, of course, this is pure foreshadowing. Um, Echo is the nymph, um, I'm sorry, is a nymph that uh, Narcissus uh, meets. So there's nymph nymphs all over the place. Nymphs are also very primal. They're, they're very close to, their, their job essentially is to uh, flower natural beauty to take the wild beauty of things outside of civilization which is already you know an issue um, and make it beautiful they're all female and they're all considered very very attractive Narcissus is also a hunter many of you know the symbolism of the hunter the hunter is almost always a negative stereotype in ancient literature uh, Nimrod, the founder of Babylon, was a hunter. These are people who are extremely aggressive. They're constantly searching for material goods. And just like the regime we talked about before, they're never happy. Because material goods, they come to be, they pass away. Um, it's temporarily pleasurable, and then it goes away. The need doesn't stop. And you get used to it, and then you want more. That's what the hunter is associated with. The hunter is always, always, almost always male and is obsessed with power, absolutely obsessed with power. So this is what Narcissus uh, becomes. He meets Echo, another nymph, a nymph that prior to meeting Narcissus never stopped talking. Um, Echo became somewhat famous among the gods because when Jupiter was engaged in his well-known extramarital affairs, Echo would um, distract Juno or Hera, Zeus's or, or Jupiter's wife. 
Echo's job was to kind of keep her occupied so Zeus can get out of there, wherever he is. You know, to, to, to go out the back door. So Echo's job was to protect Zeus rhetorically um, for his adultery. So again, we, we barely started the story. And you have primal irrational urges, you have rape, and now you have adultery. We haven't even started here. Now, Hera, of course, the mother of the gods, um, or, you know, the kind of the, the matron god, goddess, uh, the goddess of the family, especially as people get older, um, curses Echo. Once she realizes what she's doing, she curses her in a very eccentric way. The curse is to be able only to repeat the last few words of what someone else says. So if someone says a sentence, the only way she can respond is either to repeat it or at least the second half of it. Uh, Juno says, Your tongue, so freely wagged at my expense, shall be of little use, your endless voice much shorter than your tongue. And then the nymph was stricken. Um, so the nymph is a female spirit. It's a sp female spirit of the natural world. Goddesses, the very minor goddesses of the forest, rivers, whatever, meadows. Um, so, um, and they, again, they, they have a very primal center. They, they've been around as long as anything's been around. Um, you even see, like in, you know, Hesiod talks about, you know, the deriving from, you know, Uranus and, and Kronos. Um, the nymphs are, are very, very ancient. And I mentioned the primal entity here, the primal origin, because these lusts, these drives, aren't rational. They're beyond reason. They're immediate. Of course, reason is strictly mediated. Um, but Narcissus, to continue the story, grew up almost being worshipped by people. His attractiveness, which as far as we can tell, is really only physical, is um, is so extraordinary that he himself becomes very arrogant about it. The center of the story is that he comes to believe that the only um, that the, the people aren't aren't worthy of him, and he's searching as a hunter for someone worthy of him to love. Even the most beautiful nymphs aren't good enough, including Echo. And Ovid talks about the pathless woods. He's out of civilization, where only the primal urges exist. He's a hunter, and as always, they're searching for things. Um, Echo, the nymph, falls in love with him very quickly. And as um, Narcissus is, is hunting, he notices her or hears something, and he would say something like, who's there? And because of the curse, um, Echo would just say, there, or here. So if so, when Narcissus says, come here, all she could say in return is, come here. Um, or, you know, please don't avoid me. And she says, don't avoid me. It sounds like she's playing with him in, in a good way. That she's being flirty, so to speak. Um, so now you're outside of civilization, so you're in a primal area um, with people who are, you know, they're, they're the way they are, either from rape or adultery, based entirely on what we call the brain, brain stem, like a zombie, motivated entirely by the lower drives. And when you look like narcissist, did, this mostly goes for women, but in, in this case, uh, it goes for him too, you don't really have to worry about much. He got whatever he needed. But this connection between um, Echo and Narcissus is based on a total lack of communication. Neither one of them has any, first of all, neither one of them um, knows really anything but themselves. They've never known rejection. They've never really had to communicate. A beautiful woman really doesn't have to do much in her life. She gets whatever she wants, whenever she wants it. 
They don't have to be smart. They don't have to be nice. They don't have to be anything. They simply have to exist. So you have people who are self-absorbed. Um, the very fact that, that Echo was involved in trying to cover for, for Zeus's extramarital affairs shows you what, what that's all about. They think Zeus simply using these people. Um, but what Narcissus is noted, noting here is that this girl is interesting. He has no idea what, what, you know, the curse or anything else. And Echo finally gets, sees him, and according to Ovid, tries to fling him, herself at him, throw her arms around him, and he gets angry. And he says, get your hands off me. I'd rather die than someone like you ever come near me. And then in return, she says, come near me. The last three words of what, of what he said. So he can't make any sense of what she's doing. It sounds like she's really needy. I'd rather die than, um, be connected with you. And she says, connected with you. I want to be with you. you know, the, so the whole thing is based on total misunderstanding. Words and phrases are being used not to convey information, but to manipulate. Or in this case, to, uh, because she's being forced to, to mirror him. Mirroring is very important. Because, you know, think of politicians trying to sound like the common man, trying to sound like they're in tune with what people think. They mirror the uh, traits of what they think the common man is, the union man is, the working man is, whatever. Um, and they usually sound ridiculous doing it. But that's what's happening here. But again... She's not worthy of him. She's not perfect. And therefore, he not only rejects her, but does it in a contemptuous way. Then Echo goes to Nemesis, also a female. The goddess that deals with um, revenge for people with power who don't deserve it. People who have good fortune without working. People who live according to their looks, like narcissists does. People who have illegitimate power and wealth. Uh, people who collect rents, to use the formal term. Echo, now she's been cursed. She's been rejected by this guy. She, she, she's obsessed with this guy very quickly. Believing that my fulfillment as a nymph isn't in the fact that I'm a nymph or that I work for Zeus at one point. No, it's this guy. Her entire personhood is based around having this man. And when she's rejected, she um, goes to Nemesis. And Nemesis takes her case, apparently. And that's where the famous part where he comes across the pool of water. And we all know what happens. And for the most part, interpretations of the story... Sometimes it's it's ambiguous, but of course this has been told several times by others too. Obviously, it's more most important. It's not clear if narcissist is aware of who he's looking at. In fact, generally speaking, the consensus is that the, he has no idea. In the medieval version of the story, he um, he thinks it's a woman in there. All mental illnesses are based on delusion. Believing something's there when it's not, or vice versa. It's unclear what Narcissus sees when he sees himself in the pool. He's not really seeing the actual reflection like we would see because of the curse of Nemesis, but just also because of his personality in general. He sees an ideal projection of what he thinks he is. The curse just keeps him there. Just like Echo put her entire identity into having this guy, Narcissus then puts his entire identity into this reflection. Turns out that the reflection is just nothing more than a projection of what Narcissus thinks the perfect person is. He's not aware that it's actually him, though. Jung makes a big deal about this. 
So you, you add the foundations of the story, the rapes, the adultery, the manipulation, the, you know, the worst aspects of civilization. Then you take that outside of civilization because they meet each other in the, in the, in the, in the woods with no, it's actually, he says pathless woods. Civilization is not there. Without civilization, there's no language. There's no real communication. But they were not capable of it anyway. Echo is not capable of communicating, really. But neither is Narcissus. But they're both searching for them. Narcissus especially. He's been alone his entire life. In fact, it's hinted that he's a virgin. Because he won't touch anybody. No one is good enough. One of the worst aspects of this disease, this now institutionalized condition. Same thing goes for anxiety and depression, all these issues. The person suffering here doesn't really see external reality. External reality is a projection of their distorted minds. It doesn't take genius to see the connection with how the regime functions. You don't get to that level of power and wealth an overwhelming uh, coercive ability, a power that we couldn't even dream of and end up being a normal person. They're not. They are amoral at best. It's unclear whether or not Narcissus is aware that he can't leave because he eventually just simply, you know, fades away. Same thing for Echo. They both essentially fade away to nothing. Later versions of the story have Cupid um, uh, as the one who, you know, puts the um, golden arrow into into Echo, um, which, of course, is, again, irrational desire. The fact that Narcissus comes from the river god is extremely important because, again, that's sub-rational drives. This is where the mental illnesses uh, come from. None of these people are actually seeing reality. Echo comes to the point where she thinks that her entire world only matters. It only really can come to fruition if she has him, having seen him only, you know, just briefly. Then to be rejected with that level of contempt. So both of these people are complete. They're not, um, both of these people are deeply flawed. The regime sees us as a projection of their own illness. They don't see people. They don't see opposition. They see us like the Soviets saw um, their opposition. Uh, dangerous, unpredictable. Um, and by no means should be given any kind of representation. They deserve, at best, a trip to the mental institution which is going to start happening because you have these constant um, drives to, to paint everyone as crazy. Um, you know, you've been called every mental illness name, you know, schizo, whatever, bipolar, um, and you're usually the first thing they say half the time. Believing in a so-called conspiracy theory means that there's something wrong with you mentally. These are, all, of course, both projections and deflections, but that's something they're not capable of. They're not, they're not capable of understanding. That's how the regime sees us. Narcissus sees himself in the pool as a projection of everything he thinks a lover should be. It's not real. Yes, he's seeing himself in his own attractiveness, but he doesn't know that. He sees this ideal um, uh, projection of everything that finally there's somebody worthy of me. So it's not a matter of arrogance. I mean, besides the fact that he was cursed. It's a matter of the fact that the power that his status gave him, just like how the oligarchy, oligarchy functions today, that level of power has destroyed any ability for these people to have a normal relationship with somebody. They only associate with each other. In Narcissus' case, there's only one person. It's almost like he deliberately split himself into two so he could finally have some kind of relationship, even though, I mean, he, he tries to hug it, he tries to grab it, and of course it's water. 
And somehow, the curse breaks down his cognitive ability. The parallels are so clear here that the ancients understood. Um, to some extent, narcissists may uh, represent the, uh, the senatorial elite, uh, often tended to support, you know, a, a monarchy, um, as, you know, um, um, the author of the Aeneas, uh, Aeneid, I should say, did. And this is one of the reasons that they were, they became so famous. Um, and so they saw this arrogance. The oligarchy is clearly reflected here, I think. No pun intended. And this is, um, this is just the very beginning. Now we've come to the end of the hour here. I didn't quite get to everything I wanted to do. But I think my point has been made very clearly. Um, we're not dealing with a principled debate here. It's not a matter of, of someone has the facts and someone doesn't. It's deeper than that. At the elite level anyway, and even uh, otherwise, those supporting liberalism, which is not an ideology, but it is the regime, intellectually speaking, um, don't even understand what we think. They've never heard it. They don't want to hear it. Even people specializing in allegedly what we do, university professors, really don't know. And when you hear them try to describe what we believe, it's usually the most ridiculous character. It's a mockery. The regime is completely irrational. The only thing we can do when you're dealing with these people is be aware of what's going on, aware of the roots of their power. Do not lash out. Do not get angry. And simply make sure that you call all this stuff out. They'll use tactics, as we mentioned before. They'll use every possible method to shut us up, to humiliate us. You stay calm. You focus on the central fact at hand and recognize what you're dealing with here. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Support Dr. Johnson at RustJournal.org. Again, that's rusjournal.org.